Welcome to my talk on Advances in Continuum Robots for Surgery. I am recording this talk for the Virtual Mini Symposium on Robotics and Surgery organized by WISE in London. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Jessica Bergner-Kars and I am the director of the Continuum Robotics Laboratory at the University of Toronto, where I'm an associate professor in mathematical and computational sciences, computer science and mechanical and industrial engineering. The background on this slide is my vision. Surgeons and Continuum robots are working hand in hand benefiting patients by approaching a surgical procedure, procedure with unprecedented minimal trauma through a keyhole. Now for the past decade, we have seen some great progress in Continuum Robotics. The field matured quite a bit and there exist several concepts on how to achieve these continuously bending robots at a small scale. One of those is the concentric tube continuum robot, sometimes also called an active cannula or tubular continuum robot. In the video he playing here, you see the latest prototype in our laboratory. It's composed of concentric tubes that are super elastic and pre-curved, and by translating and rotating them relative to one another, we can achieve these often referred to as tentacle-like motion at a very small scale. This concept has been originally proposed by Webster and DuPont independently at IROS 2006, and it's in fact world's smallest continuum robot. Concentric tube continuum robots actually got me into continuum robotics research about 10 years ago now. I started off as a postdoc in Bob Webster's lab at Vanderbilt University. And at that time, um, we have been super excited because the um, robot has just been invented and Caleb Brucker just published a model with a Kosrad theory of elastic rods, which was fairly accurate. And so we were very convinced that these robots would end up in an operating room at operating room at no time. So it was natural um, to approach research top down from an application perspective. And I think this is often done in surgical robotics as we are discussing with our medical collaborators. They identify an application, they tell us about their challenges in surgery, um, ask us for improvements, and maybe sometimes they even see one of our robots and think it could revolutionize a surgical approach. So we did the same thing, and I'm gonna talk about um, these two particular applications that I have been focusing on back then. One of which is transnasal surgery, where we approach the pituitary gland at the very center of our skull through the nase, transnasally, transphenoidally to dissect the tumor in a keyhole fashion. On the right side, we see intracerebral hemorrhage evacuation, which is um, when a stroke causes a vessel to burst within the brain and a hemorrhage forms that sometimes needs to be evacuated. So the blood essentially has to be um, sucked out. And so this is also a good idea to do this through a keyhole, just having a little burr hole on the skull surface, advancing a concentric tube robot to that hemorrhage and sucking it out um, in a keyhole fashion. So we did all that. We implemented um, um, the this C++ version of the, of the kinematic model in real time, derived the differential kinematics, built robot prototypes, looked at teleoperation, human machine interface, image feedback, um, also made some significant progress for the um, intracerebral hemorrhage evacuation, built a robot prototype that was also sterilizable. We're thinking about how to make tube exchanges in the operating room did like some experiments um, in the in the CT scanner to have image feedback and a semi-autonomous removal after doing motion planning. And so that led us to quite some um, significant advances uh, research-wise. Um, you only see a subset of the papers that we published at multiple conferences and journals um, and some of the research progress that is associated with this. So while this has been great progress. Um, coming back to using continuum robots in surgery, as I have shown on my title slide, today we must really say that we are not quite there yet. So there has been no continuum robot that helped a single patient yet. And I argue that one of the reasons is that we only approach this top down. As soft and continuum robotics is often associated with a quite significant paradigm shift in robotics that is turning away from rigid link structures to 
jointless compliant bodies, there are fundamental research questions that need to be addressed. And I fear that some of those got lost as we've purely focused on top-down research. And that's actually why we have turned away from top-down application-driven research to some extent for the past years in my lab. Instead, we focused on bottom-up research in continuum robotics to solve some of those key questions that I think are important to solve in order to get to this, um, this vision that I have that these robots are working hand-in-hand -hand with surgeons. Now, throughout the talk, I'm going to um, address different continuum robot types and different challenges and talk a little bit about these bottom-up research questions that we have been solving. For the concentric tube continuum robot, the robot that I started my continuum robotics career off with, um, is, as I said, the smallest. And so, as it is composed of those concentric super elastic tubes, they have to be chosen quite carefully for an application. And so, a fundamental research question is actually a concerned with the tube design. So how can we select appropriate tube parameters to not only fulfill those workspace requirements that a surgical application might have, but also stiffness requirements as the robot inherently is compliant. And another area of, of fundamental questions is concerned with control. As these robots are you know, deploying into the human body, for example, through the nose, we need to be able to enforce some shape constraints such that we do not interfere with the environment if we do not like so. And another question that is concerned with control is, can we achieve submillimetric accuracy with these kind of robots, which may be an important prerequisite for their use in surgery. Now, the tube design um, aspect of things has been something that I started working on during my postdoc. I came up with some initial heuristic based computational tube design optimization methods, um, which have all been solving like single objectives, for example, seeking and covering a certain workspace as much as possible. Now, Josephine, she has been a, a PhD student in my lab for the past couple of years and graduated last fall, and she's now a postdoc at Vanderbilt University. During her thesis work, she had focused on a more holistic view on these computational tube design optimization process. She was looking at understanding how we can consider multiple objectives in this optimization process, and those objectives might be competing, in fact, and while at the same time also optimizing for more tube parameters in previous research, we have only seen that people focus on curvatures and curved lengths of these tubes, neglecting or just setting a priori some parameters for inner and outer diameter, as well as the elastic modulus by just assuming uh, one type of super elastic material. And so what she came up with is um, a robot specific optimization scheme that uses particle swarm optimization, but uh, the multi-objective version of it. So what we actually get out of it is the optimized parameters in, in form of a Pareto optimal set. So really um, looking at how can we, you know, find a good balance between those um, com objectives that we would like to optimize for. And this is just showing one example, which is the result of the particle swarm optimization for two objectives, one of which is having as large of a workspace as possible. That is what you see on the x-axis in square centimeters. And on the y-axis, you see the deflection of the robot in millimeters if it was subject to 1.5 Newtons acting on its tip. So we kind of want it to be minimally deflected so that it's able to do this um, task with a certain force. So those two are obviously conflicting because the workspace would be smaller the less deflection we allow, so the tubes would be stiffer, resulting in a smaller workspace. And you can see we can find a good trade-off here. And just to give you a visual example, so these are some of the results that Josephine uh, achieved in her thesis work. On the left side, you see some previous results that I have achieved with computational design optimization, purely focusing on the workspace. And we see in gray the unloaded robot case. This is what I optimized for. And just for the purpose of seeing how really not suitable this robot was, is we also visualize in blue the loaded case, the 1.5 Newtons acting at the tip. 
And you can see this robot was just not stiff enough, so it deflects quite a bit. So while it had a good workspace, it might have not been able to perform any meaningful task in this workspace. Now on the right side, you see the results of the multi-objective particle swarm optimization from Josephine. And you see that the workspace volume is actually larger, while at the same time, the deflection, the mean deflection is actually quite small. And you see the loaded and unloaded cases, there's almost no deflection in between. So that's, that's great news. And also her optimization scheme now can optimize for 13 parameters rather than just six. And she can namely just, you know, also take care of tube precurvatures, tube length, inner outer diameter, and the elastic modulus by considering different of those for different materials. So that's quite promising in terms of tube design as the scheme is now applicable for various applications. Another aspect is enforcing shape constraints. Here we show some preliminary results that we published at last year's ICRA. Um, where we have the um, original position controller, but also a secondary task enforcing a shape constraint uh, somewhere along the robot. So a single point along the robot that we would like to stay in place while the, stip, while the tip of the robot is still moving. And you can see some simulation um, results here. First, without enforcing the shape constraint, you see that the robot tip traces the circular trajectory and the body of the robot is uh, moving as it is required to have the tip follow the circular arc. Enforcing the shape constraint with the controller that we have been proposing, you see that the robot now actually stays in place at the location of the enforced shape constraint, which is quite promising results when you think about a medical application where this robot is reaching to some deep-seated location, so we would probably like the body of the robot to stay in place. Looking at um, how accurate can we actually target a position. So here, this was a collaboration with my husband when we were both still back at Leibniz University. Um, he's now also at the University of Toronto. But here you see what we did. So we used vision in the loop, a stereo camera system uh, in a surgical microscope. And well, I guess we turn back to some extent to the medical application here by using chicken breast and marking 10 target positions that we also uh, tracked using imaging. And then we have a visual marker at the tip of the robot that we track. And then we visually servo the robot to these desired uh, tip positions on the surface of the chicken breast. Um, we did this for these 10 positions and we were quite encouraged that the error we obtained was below 0.2 millimeters, so submillimetric, which was really, to the best of the knowledge, the first time that that has been shown using concentric tube continuum robots. Another continuum robot design that is often used leverages tendon actuation. These robots usually have some larger diameter of greater than 5 millimeters usually. And the tendon actuation is quite common in surgical instruments that we know, right? So, for example, flexible endoscopes and catheters. Not so in continuum robots, this is quite useful. However, when we think about these robots deploying into the human body, there's one effect that might not be as desirable because as the section length are fixed, also the, um, the achievable bending radii, radii are are limited, so we would need to translate the whole body of the robot to have it deploy, and by that it can really not follow any curvilinear path. So one question we have been asking here is in terms of continuum robot design, how to design a deployable continuum manipulator with multiple bending sections? And directly related to this design question is the most motion planning aspect of it. So how can we achieve this follow the leader motion? So having the robot's body follow the exact same path as its tip during deployment, such that it can actually follow any curvilinear part. Now to address this, we came up with a pretty neat idea back in 2014, where we have developed these extensible sections. And you can see here a photograph of this robot. It's a regular tendon actuated continuum robot. We have the backbone in the center, which is nickel titanium tube. You see these red uh, tendon threads routed through the tendon routing disks. And you might see there is something suspicious about those disks. 
And that's because there are permanent magnets sandwiched in between those. They have uh, alternating polarity orientation. So when we um, extend the section length by, you know, just extending the tubular backbone, these tendon routing discs, which are not fixed at the backbone, can now distribute themselves along the lengths. And thanks to the magnetic repulsion, they will actually stay at almost equidistant spacing. This allows us now to build a multiple segment continuum robot prototype by using multiple concentric tubes. But having those magnetic um, tendon routing discs such that we can have a three segment robot with the regular motion that we can achieve by tendon actuation. But now those segments can also extend and contract as you can see here. So the robot becomes deployable. This particular prototype here has a diameter of seven millimeters and three segments, each of which can have a length of 15 to 17 millimeters, 70 millimeters. Now it somewhat combines the best of two worlds. So it uses the concentric tube principle to achieve deployment capabilities as those can extend and contract. And as the tendon routing discs are distributing themselves equidistantly, we also get a good distribution of the bending moments that we employ through tendon actuation. So the bending is active, not passive as in concentric tube robots, but we still gain the extensibility. And you can see here in this video that the robot can actually deploy along a curvilinear pass quite well. Um, these are some of the pass deployments errors that we observe, these are five paths, and you see the error in terms of percent in respect to the maximum length of the robot is about 2.59%. It, it's quite encouraging considering that this was an open loop experiment that was model based, so there were no, was no sensor feedback that's subject to future work to integrate some, some of those and have a closed loop controller. Now the last area I would like to touch on today is um, embracing compliance. So Continuum robots are inherently compliant, right? So they are composed of elastic materials that makes them very versatile and safe to use to, um, to or even within a human. So this compliance is great on the one hand, but also quite a challenge on the other hand. Any force acting on the robot, as you can see, will deform it quite a bit. And while we can say that's a great asset as uh, we can implement things like embodied intelligence, it also means that we cannot really apply large forces. So that might be limiting in the applications that we seek. So for the past years in my lab, we have been looking at ways to achieve variable stiffness in continuum robots, such that the state can be compliant when desired and stiff when needed. We have also been looking at ways how to embrace this compliance and utilizing it to um, actually perform a task. And I'm going to touch on how we did this in the, in the last couple minutes of the talk. To achieve variable stiffness, we have been looking at various stiffening mechanisms. And from our perspective, a really um, promising technique is this layer jamming that we showcase here. So using a scale structure that is wrapped around a cylinder such that multiple of those scales overlap uh, at any point and in enclosing it in a, in a silicone bladder allows us to have a flexible structure. And by applying a vacuum, the scales will actually be pressed onto each other. The friction causes the whole, um, the whole sheath to, to stiffen up. So we have that soft and stiffened up state um, as soon as we apply or, or take off the, the vacuum. And you can see in the inside is hollow. So this uh, we propose this being an outer sheath that can be ap applied to any continuum robot to address some of the stiffness problems. Um, in the paper that we published in Soft Robotics, we have seen that we can achieve a stiffness increase of um, 10 to 24 times depending on the robot configuration. And just to give you an example, so we leveraged this concept study in a variable stiffness robot prototype. Um, here you see the robotic, um, so the skeleton composed of three segments just moving around. It's actuated by push-pull wires. It has a camera at the tip. And so we integrated the stiffening sheath to it. Here you can see the final prototype. 
um, I guess here also, again, we had the medical application in our minds while doing this like more uh, design work um, as we deployed here a um, coupling mechanism that would allow for the actuation unit to be covered in a sterile bag, for example. This was work by my former PhD student Erna Amanov. He finished his dissertation last year at Leibniz University Hanover, and he's now also a postdoc in Bob Webster's lab, continuing his work on continuum robotics. Now, the last thing I would like to talk about today is some work that we have just recently been starting, which is on collaborating continuum robots. So to overcome and actually embrace the compliance of continuum robots, we have been looking at ways to have them work together. One example is in collaboration with my former postdoc Taha Chikawi in France. Um, and together we are looking at dual arm concentric tube continuum robots for teleoperation tasks, thinking of ways to combine them. For example, one doing a primary task, the other doing a secondary task, such as keeping a constant distance from the first one or both of them performing a common task and therefore being able to apply higher forces, for example. Another research area that I'm really excited about are parallel continuum robots. This is some work that we started back at Leibniz University, where my lab was located until the beginning of last year before moving to the University of Toronto. This was is still joint work with Professor Tobias Oitmeyer's uh, lab. And here you see some preliminary results where we build a parallel p continuum robot structure uh, acting in the plane. Here it's tracing a circular trajectory. And it is our underlying idea that by combining continuum robots into parallel structures, we might benefit from the structural advantages such as the high dexterity and compliance, but at the same time, hopefully also seeing some kinematic performances as they are beneficial in parallel structures. Um, some of this work is going to be uh, presented this year at IROS and was just recently accepted for publication in the Robotics and Automation Letters. The latest state of the research is um, something which I premiere today. So this video airs the very first time. It's our spatial parallel continuum robot. You see three tendon actuated um, robots acting in parallel on a common platform. And here we derive the quasi static model, built this prototype and see some really great results, which we are currently in preparation of publishing. So stay tuned for what's coming here. And it's actually our vision in the lab now that having multiple continuum robots entering a workspace from multiple directions through keyholes, meeting at the location of interest and collaboratively performing a task could be the way to go to embrace the challenge of compliance in the future. And while this is very early on work, I could see this also being possible to use in some medical applications. So this concludes uh, the talk. Thank you for listening today. You see a subset of the students that have been working with me on these exciting research uh, problems over the past years. Uh, you also see our uh, funding sources. I wanna thank you all for listening. Um, I'm looking forward to discuss some of those um, aspects with you in the, in the panel later. <laughs>